In this video, we will introduce the most famous monk in Japanese history. EQ. Thanks to a hugely popular anime series and a series of children's books, he is the famous quizzical wit who never fails to raise a guffaw from people of all ages. Although portrayed as a young boy by popular culture, he was actually a monk who drank alcohol, ate meat, slept with both women and men, and spoke truth to power with his sharp tongue. Let's see. Ikki was born in 1394, in Kyoto, to a low-ranking noblewoman of the southern court. This was just two years after the unification of the northern and southern imperial courts under the shogun Ashikaga Yoshimitsu. The boy is believed to have been the illegitimate son of Emperor Gokomatsu. Yoshimitsu, who favored the northern line, feared that the child could be used as a political weapon. For this reason, he was separated from his mother at the age of six and sent to the Rinzai Zen Temple, Ankakuji, where he trained to become a monk. Ikkyu was a brilliant student who excelled at the composition of Chinese poetry in particular. To distract himself from a deep sense of loneliness, he immersed himself in Buddhist studies, becoming a stickler for spiritual rigor. As a result, he very quickly grew sick and tired of the monks around him, boasting about their family backgrounds and personal, without actually practicing Buddhism. In a bid to escape these trivial power games, at the age of 17, Ikkyu entered the temple Saikonji and studied under Keno Sowi, a sincere and austere master on the true path of Zen. As a result, Saikonji was a poor temple that was not protected by the shogunate and therefore enjoyed considerable freedom thought and expression. Ikkyu embraced a non-mainstream form of Zen, renouncing all material wealth and comfort to pursue an austere life of study and contemplation. When he was 20 years old, in acknowledgement that he had inherited all his master's teachings, he became known as Sojun, a derivative of Sowi. However, one month later, his master, in whom he had absolute trust, died suddenly. Ironically, in the same month, there was a coronation ceremony for his half-brother, who became emperor. In stark contrast to the pomp and ceremony of the imperial court, Ikkyu and his fellow monks could not afford to give their master a modest funeral. Distressed, Ikkyu hauled himself up in the temple and fasted for seven days, but was unable to attain a calming state enlightenment. Overwhelmed by grief, he attempted to commit suicide by jumping into fast-flowing river from a high bridge. But in the nick of time, a servant sent by his mother stopped him. The year after Ken No's death, Ikkyu met a new master, Kasor Sordon. It was Kasor who gave him the name Ikkyu. Kasor had turned his back on the capital's corrupt Buddhist establishment and opened a temple in a countryside. The poverty of his new home forced Ikkyu to take various side hustles, such as sewing small drawstring bags and dolls for wealthy patrons. One night, Ikkyu was meditating in a boat on Lake Biwa, caressed by a gentle breeze when he heard the familiar call of a crow. In that moment, he achieved profound sense of enlightenment. His master wanted to grant him an Inca, a much prized certificate, declaring the recipient as an enlightened soul, qualified to transmit the Dharma. 
But Ikkyu detested such earthly formalities and refused to accept it. He continued studying, while looking after his ailing master, who was bedridden and entirely incontinent. Unlike his more squeamish fellow monks, Ikkyu the unpretentious iconoclast, refused to use chopsticks to scoop up his master's excrement. In the midst of this deeply devoted care of his master, he received a letter from his father, the former emperor. It explained that his half-brother, current emperor, was about to die at the age of 28, with no sons to continue the line of succession. Ikkyu rejected any suggestion that he should ascend the imperial throne, asserting his status as a devoted monk and recommending a distant relation. Both his beloved mentor and royal half-brother died a short time later as Ikkyu reached the age of 35. He left the temple, adopting the life of an itinerant monk, wandering the countryside in search of further sources of enlightenment. Even without the surreal opportunity to go from abject poverty to imperial power, caring for the dying can have a profound effect on a person's sense of value. Hence, it was around this time that Ikkyu's famous eccentricities became noticeable. At first, he let his hair and beard grow long openly ate meat, and most shocking of all, admitted to a love of alcohol and sex with women. People were astonished, since this was considered unbecoming behavior from a respected Zen monk. In a book of Chinese poems, Kyo Wunshu, Ikkyu writes, I used to flirt with women in the lively pleasure quarter of song and dance, drink sake, in the company of pretty, elegant boys. I met a beautiful woman in the narrow streets of the town, and said to her, the hem of your kimono is tasteful and lovely. I'm sorry to part without knowing you. In response to Ikki's open admission, that he was willing to break every precept and precedent, people began referring to him as her Kaisor, or the rule-breaking monk. Until then, Zen had been the sole preserve of the elite warrior's class, who had the benefit of a classical Chinese education. But Ikkyu sought to make Zen accessible to the largely illiterate masses, in Osaka, Ikkyu attracted attention by swaggering though the town's bustling streets, carrying a highly ornate red sword, which looked very out of place with his threadbare monk's robes. When asked, the enlightened vagabond replied, This is a wooden sword. Like the so-called priests that run rampant in this world, it is a handsome fake that is utterly useless and just can't cut it. His admonishment was not reserved solely for the fake priests, but also the townspeople who bought into their bullshit. Back in Kyoto, he was angry at the sight of nobles and bureaucratic official living in the lap of luxury, when the streets were stacked with corpses from frequent epidemics and natural disasters. In the midst of New Year celebrations, Ikkyu paraded through the well-heeled crowds, with a skull on top of his long walking staff, yelling, Beware! Beware! Asked why he was interrupting the celebration with such grim behavior, Ikkyu responded, New Year's Day is a milestone on your journey towards death. While you are daydreaming, you will turn into a skeleton. 
beneath Ikkyu's eccentric outbursts, was a sincere attitude to Zen, that won the hearts of many. However, throughout his life, he was venomous in his contempt for power and greed, especially among the priests. He considered the purple robes, worn by high-ranking monks like himself, as a symbol of corruption, preferring the rags of an itinerant vagabond. Arriving at an ostentatious mansion, in response to a request to perform a memorial service, the gatekeepers took one look at his attire and sent him away. The following day, EQ arrived in the purple robes associated with his high status. Then, the master of the house, rushed out to welcome him. Flinging off his robes, EQ declared, I am worth nothing. But, these purple rags seem to have real value, for you. So, why don't you ask them to recite the sutra for your ceremony? Whereupon, he turned on his heel and left. One of many examples of Ikkyu, the protopunk, delivering a performance that drew attention to the ugly truth, lurking behind polite appearances. Ikkyu reserved his most unforgiving anger for corrupt Rinzai monks, in particular a fellow, senior disciple of Kasor, named Yoosor. In Osaka, Yoosor had built a monastery that issued Inca, or certificates of enlightenment, to attendees of his lecture program which almost certainly incurred entrance fees in the form of lavish donations. This fast food approach to enlightenment had earned the mission a considerable following. Yoosu insisted that his motives were pure, and he was raising money to help finance of the Daitokuji Temple, the spiritual home of the Rinzai Zen sect. Here, the monks wore elaborate kimonos and preached enlightenment without questioning the understanding of Zen amongst their parishioners. Twice, the imperial court had refused to grant honorary titles to the temple's spiritual leader, who considered himself something of a national treasure in the area of Zen studies. Ikkyu had no time for those who used Zen as a business opportunity. He edited a book condemning the Rinzai sect's spiritual leaders, who beneath their pleasant and unassuming veneer, displayed a profound lack of empathy, with an unacceptable level of vanity and greed. They seek wealth and honor that does not belong to them, which means they have to struggle for it, like small fish trying to swallow a whale. Ikkyu lamented the decline of the Rinzai sect, which had become systematically corrupt and lacking in true spirit. The problem with common sense, is that it's not very common. Ikkyu recognized that the wisdom of crowds involves, surrendering to the herd instinct, which almost always serves the convenience of corrupt, materially obsessed elites. He went about expressing a belief, that spiritual journeys are a highly individual experience, in his own unique way. He wrote, The voices of monks, gathered in the main hall, cooking incense to show off, and chanting sutras, are noisy and disturbing. Enjoying pillow talk with a woman is far more spiritually fulfilling to me. Like many of Europe's romantic and Findus Siecla poets, EQ weaponizes decadence to wage war on polite society's underlying culture of greed, corruption, and cruelty. He was concerned that Zen was becoming a kind of fashionable social form, without spiritual substance. The deep contemplation of existential koans, or thought puzzles, 
to surpass the enlightenment of one's master, was disappearing. Replaced by, scenario-driven epithets. That felt closer to an instruction manual. Rather than robotically follow such redundant methods, IQ went against the sexist norms of the time by highlighting the intellectual value of talking to women after an amorous encounter. In his ongoing battle against corrupt authority, hypocritical customs, and discriminatory traditions, IQ sought solace and perhaps a solution to his lifelong battle with loneliness in the brothels on towns and cities. This is where he spent almost every penny he earned, from his calligraphy and the composition of eulogies. But in his later years, he finally met two people he trusted wholeheartedly. They were Renyo and Shinjo. Renyo was the eighth head priest of Shin Buddhism, which began in the 13th century and is the most widely practiced branch of Buddhism in Japan today. It is said that this is largely due to Renya's achievements within his lifetime. Although Ikkyu was 19 years older than Renyo, they shared the same enthusiasm for Buddhism, culture, intelligent discourse and perhaps above all, the fact that they both entered Buddhist studies at the tender age of six. Adults in the modern world, who were sent away to single-sex boarding schools at an impressionable age, frequently say that the experience left them feeling hollow. And perhaps, IQ found in Renyo an echo of his own lifelong battle with these empty feelings of loneliness. Curious to verify rumors of Renyo's outstanding character, IQ hid a small sparrow in his hand. In a test that precedes Schrodinger's cat, by several centuries, he asked Renyo, is the sparrow in my hand, alive, or dead? Smiling, Renyo placed one foot on the staircase behind him, and asked in return, am I trying to climb, or descend these stairs? Thus, IQ confirmed that his new acquaintance was, as an eminent theoretical physicist might say, the cat's whiskers. As their inseparable friendship grew, so did the number of stories with an equally profound philosophical theme. A wealthy merchant, who had acquired a magnificent painting of a horse, sent it to Ikkyu, the calligrapher of high repute, hoping for an appraisal that would add to its value. Ikkyu's reply was, the philosophical forerunner of the Surrealist Masterpiece, by René Magritte, The Treachery of Images. The five-word response was, It looks like a horse. Furious, the wealthy merchant lambasted Ikkyu, until Renyo explained the logic, that no matter how elaborately painted, a portrait of a horse is a picture, not an actual horse. For the irate merchant, in search of material acquisition, the philosophical depth of Ikkyu's reply was entirely lost, and he left without another word. At the age of 77, Ikkyu fell madly in love with a much younger woman called Shinjo, who would be the first and last woman that he lived with. They were constant companies until his death and his poems from this period, are uninhibited in describing his feelings for her. Of course, Ikkyu didn't care that polite society were alarmed by his latest break with tradition. Shinjo exorcised Ikkyu's lifelong feeling of loneliness. And although his writing remained tempestuous, it's likely he found real peace of mind at the age of 77. After the Daitokuji Temple, spiritual home the Rinzai sect, burnt to the ground during a fierce civil war, the emperor ordered 80-year-old Ikkyu to lead the rebuilding effort. 
When Ikki went in search of donations, he found that not only wealthy samurai and merchants were willing to contribute, but also ordinary people. As a result, the reconstruction was completed within the unexpectedly short time frame of five years. Like the cathedral builders of Europe, Ikki's earthy and unpretentious dedication has transformed the Zen, faith of an educated elite, into a spiritual commonwealth. But of course true to form, Ikki refused to live in the opulent product of his efforts, and continued to occupy his own modest temple. Ikki died of malaria, at the age of 88. In stark contrast to the lofty and pretentious last word of the great and the good throughout history, the iconoclastic realist simply said, I don't want to die. Ikki's grave is in the grounds of Shuonji Temple in Kyoto, which is also known as Ikkyuji. However, his gated tomb is under the jurisdiction of the Imperial Household Agency, which forbids entrance to visitors, whether or not they are dressed in rags. The locked gate is marked with a chrysanthemum crest to assert royal authority over the maintenance of Ikkyu's post-mortal loneliness. Would Ikkyu, the prodigal blue blood, a vagabond poet who opened up Zen to the world and found solace for so many years with common whores, see any merit at all in the dubious honor of being isolated from the world? Or perhaps, he would simple chuckle at the cruel irony of his final resting place, being turned into the most exclusive of monuments. We hope you enjoyed the story of Japan's erotic, poetic monk, and his lifelong battle against meaningless affectation, which marks him out as the philosophical predecessor to so many radical ideas of the 20th century modernism. Let us know in the comments. And perhaps we'll feature IQ again in a future video.